term serial killer should be associated with Ted Bundy. When this word is heard, everyone remembers a heartless and ruthless killer. Even thinking about his crimes causes terror. Before he was executed in 1989, he confessed to murdering 40 young women in 12 American states over a terrifying four-year period. In this way, he became one of the most terrible murderers in the history of America, and murder and crime are part of its culture. But what distinguishes Teddy Bundy from other serial killers? His charming personality was such that even while he was in prison awaiting execution, many women sent him marriage postcards. What reasons made Ted Bundy commit the murder of young girls and women, including 12-year-old girls? The answer to this question comes back to this devil. Many of Bundy's first victims physically resembled his first friend, who was tall with brown hair. Bundy was born on November 24, 1946, in Burlington, Vermont. Bundy's mother, Eleanor Lewis, married his father, Lloyd Marshall Cowell, at the age of 22. But the father obviously had nothing to do with his wife and child. And after that, the mother and the son went to Philadelphia to live with the mother's parents. Sometime later, Eleanor's parents, fearing that their daughter would be accused of giving birth to a child illegally, called Ted their child and made him believe that his mother was his older sister. Eleanor and Bundy moved to Tacoma, Washington in 1950 to live with relatives and acquaintances. It was there that Eleanor legally registered another name for her child, and Ted Cowell changed to Theodore Robert Nelson, and Eleanor took the name Louise Cowell. Eleanor then married an army cook named Johnny Culpepper Bundy. After N. Ted Cowell, he changed his identity to Ted Bundy. Over time, Lois and Johnny had four children that Teddy spent most of his time taking care of. Ted never seemed to bond with his stepfather, Dot I, in the book. The only living witness, Stephen Michaud, described Bundy's teenage years as unhappy years. He considered him a shy child who was often humiliated by older children. Bundy graduated from high school in 1965 and entered the University of Puget Sound on a scholarship. He took courses in psychology and Asian studies, but after two semesters, he transferred to the University of Washington in Seattle. Bundy met a beautiful girl named Stephanie Brooks in 1967. The two quickly fell in love with each other. Life became beautiful for Bundy, and he was satisfied with his current situation. During the fall of 1968, Bundy transferred to another university and enrolled at Stanford University in Palo Alto, California. Shortly after that, Stephanie graduated from the University of Washington, and suddenly the relationship between them ended. Stephanie later explained that she felt that Bundy had no real plans or goals for the future and that she was not someone who could stand up to such a man. Bundy was confused and distracted by the loss of his first love and lost his focus on things. In the end, he had to leave the college because of the bad grades he got. Bundy began traveling across the country as he tried to forget Stephanie and return to his normal life. He finally decided to visit his hometown, Vermont, where, when he was looking for his birth records, he faced a bitter reality that annoyed him a lot. He discovered that his sister was actually his mother, and the woman who raised him was actually his grandmother. Bundy entered the university again in the fall of 1969 and passed all his units with perfect grades. He was a man who had the goal of winning Stephanie again. However, Stephanie was not interested in resuming her romance with Bundy. Bundy worked hard and became increasingly involved in politics, participating in various election campaigns. In his spare time, he worked at the Crisis Clinic in Seattle, and there he met Anne Roll, who later, as his friend, wrote about the life and crimes that Bundy committed in his best-selling book called A Stranger Beside Me. 
he took up writing.it was during that Bundy met Meg Anders, a divorced woman who worked as a secretary. The two gradually became interested in each other, and Meg fell in love with Bundy. Bundy treated him kindly and played the role of a father to Meg's little girl. However, Bundy still could not easily forget Stephanie and kept in touch with her by letter and phone. Bundy entered the university again in the fall of 1969 and passed all his units with perfect grades. He was a man who had the goal of winning Stephanie again. However, Stephanie was not interested in resuming her romance with Bundy. Bundy worked hard and became increasingly involved in politics, participating in various election campaigns. However, he did not go to college until the following academic year because of his relationship with Meg or the job he had secured for himself at the Republican Party office in Washington. During one of his trips for the Republican Party, Bundy decided to meet with Stephanie and relive the good times they had together. Bundy greatly impressed Stephanie, and the interest between the two was rekindled, and they even talked about getting married. Meg had no idea that Bundy was secretly meeting with Stephanie. This was while Bundy continued his love for Meg. Stephanie now considered Bundy the man of her dreams and thought of a bright future with Bundy. While neither woman was aware of the other's existence, they were also unaware of the transformation that was taking place for Bundy. For unknown reasons, Bundy started killing women, and his first murder happened only three days before the New Year. The victims were carefully selected, and each had a body and hairstyle similar to Stephanie's. On July 4, 1974, 18-year-old Johnny Lentz became the first gang victim. Joni lived in a big house in Seattle with some of her friends. No one suspected that something bad might have happened to her when he did not come to the table for breakfast. When his absence was prolonged, her friends gradually became worried, and when they went to his her room, they were surprised to find her blood-soaked body in her bed. When they removed the blanket from her, they were faced with a heartbreaking scene. Bundy's next victim was Linda Ann Haley, a 21-year-old meteorologist and law student at the University of Washington in Seattle. On January 31, 1974, one of Linda's roommates received a message from Linda's boss that she had not come to work. Linda's roommate went to her room and saw that her bed was made and her bike was next to the room. The day ended and there was no word from Linda. Her worried parents called the police and asked for help. As part of the investigation, the police searched Linda's room. When one of the police officers removed the bedspread, she was surprised to see that her pillow and blanket were stained with blood. Another officer found Linda's nightgown with dried blood on it. Investigators could not find any evidence of the suspect. While a police officer continued to investigate, Bundy went about his daily life in Seattle and was not the least bit worried about being recognized. In February 1974, without warning or for any apparent reason, Bundy left Stephanie Brooks for good and Stephanie never heard from or saw her again in the next few months. Seven women mysteriously disappeared in Utah, Oregon, and Washington. The method of all disappearances was similar. Tall women with long brown hair disappeared in the late hours of the day. As the search for the missing persons intensified, officers heard from several witnesses that a well-built man riding in a car with a mark on his leg or arm had been seen at several events. Many women he approached called him Ted. No one knew what happened to the girls until in August 1974, the bodies of two people were found in Washington, four miles from Lake Sammamish. Investigators came to the idea that Dennis Nasland and Yanis Ott were murdered while being tortured. Few clues were found at the scene, but the similarities between the Washington and Oregon murders quickly caught the attention of Utah investigators. Therefore, 
three states cooperated and came to the conclusion that these crimes were committed by one person. Investigators got their first serious lead on November 8, 1974, when a man in a VW car attempted to abduct an 18-year-old girl, Carol Durange, at a store in Salt Lake City. The girl was able to escape and gave the investigation officers the appearance of the man and his car. While detectives in Salt Lake City were searching for a suspect, authorities in Utah's Bountyville learned that a 17-year-old girl named Debbie Kent had gone missing from Viewmont High School. A witness later said he saw a Volkswagen speeding out of the high school parking lot. Thus, the murders stopped for four months until they resumed in Colorado, during which four women mysteriously disappeared. Almost a month later, the body of one of the women was found four miles away from where she disappeared. After the autopsy, it became clear that this woman was assaulted and killed with a sharp instrument. In Washington, the Taylor Mountains neighborhood became the place where the killer had committed several murders, one of which was later identified as 21-year-old Linda Ann Haley. Finally, on August 16, 1975, detectives found the clue they were hoping for. A highway patrol officer in Granger, Utah, reported seeing a Volkswagen on the highway. When the police were checking the car's license plate, as per the procedure, the driver fled with his car. The police chased the suspect's vehicle and saw it a few miles down the road, parked next to a building. When the police officer asked for the driver's identification, he produced his driver's license, which read Theodore Robert Bundy. Suspicious of the driver, the police officer searched his car and found a pair of handcuffs, some rope, a ski mask, a torch, an ice pick, and plastic bags. In this way, Bandy was arrested on the charge of theft. It didn't take long for detectives to find physical similarities between Bundy and the suspect who wanted to rob Carol Durange, and several witnesses were able to identify Bundy among the police suspects. Although Bundy said he was not involved in the kidnapping and murder of the victims, the police were convinced they had found the man they were looking for and began an extensive investigation into his background. In a few weeks, several witnesses from the Lake Sammamish Park area came to the police headquarters and identified a Bundy named Teddy who was walking in their area. After inspecting Bundy's apartment, the police found new evidence. They also learned that he was also known in the Taylor Mountains where several women were found dead and that he had used his credit card to buy gas in the towns where some of the women had gone missing. Evidence against Bundy increased, but he still insisted that he was innocent. While Bundy was being tried on February 23, 1976, for the attempted kidnapping of Carol Durrunch, the agents tried to find a connection between him and the other murders. According to the book, A Stranger by My Side, a handsome and polite 29-year-old Bundy changed the course of the situation in his favor during the trial. He appeared confident and calm, behaved in such a way that he was very offended by such accusations against him. Although he denied having met Durrunch, he could not give a convincing reason as to where he had been that day. Although he was sure that he could acquit himself of the accusations made by the judge regarding the kidnapping of the girl. The judge found him guilty and sentenced him to 1 to 15 years in prison. But on October 22, 1976, Colorado police charged Bundy with the murder of 23-year-old Corinne Campbell. Her raped and decomposed body was found on February 19. 1,975, and detectives believed they had enough evidence to link a gang to the crime. Bundy was returned to Colorado in April 1,977 and transferred to the Garfield County Jail, awaiting trial for Campbell's murder, scheduled for November 14, 1,977. Bandy, who could not bear to stay in prison and begin his trial, 
planned to escape from prison. Bundy, who had received special privileges to use the Patkin County Courthouse Library, was looking for an opportunity to escape, and on June 7, 1977, he managed to escape from a second-story window. Seven months later, on December 30, 1977, Bundy escaped from prison again. During these months, he ate little and was so thin that he could fit through the hole in the roof of his cell. He went through the hole to the bathroom of his guard's apartment and waited there, and when the situation was suitable, he left the apartment's main door. It took 15 hours for the prison guards to notice his absence. After leaving for Chicago, he boarded a plane and went to Florida. The officers were confused as to where he had gone. In January 1978, Bundy managed to get himself an apartment near Florida State University. He made a living through petty thefts. According to the book, the only living witness, Bundy, not satisfied with their new freedom and unable to control their urges to kill others, went into action again. On the night of January 14, 1977, he entered a boarding house and attacked four girls in the boarding house rooms. Two girls died due to injuries, but two other girls were saved. The doctor who examined the two bodies found that they were initially unconscious due to a heavy blow caused by hitting a hard object. Then they were raped and suffocated. Bundy started working again a month later. Parents of a 12-year-old girl named Kimberly Peach reported her missing. Although the police quickly intervened, the girl was not found. Six days after the little girl went missing, a police officer patrolling a residential area noticed a man driving around in a Volkswagen. The police officer checked the car's license plate number and realized that the license plate was stolen. He quickly sounded the siren and approached the car. The suspect ran away, but the police officer was able to stop him. The officer asked the driver to lie on the ground and approached him. In the meantime, the driver got into a fight with the officer, but the police officer was able to control him and handcuff him. After that, it was determined that this driver is Theodore Robert Bundy. A few days later, Bundy's true face became clear to everyone. On July 23, 1980, Bundy was found guilty of two counts of murder and sentenced to death by electric chair. At the same time, he was also accused of murdering Kimberly Leach. Her body was discovered a few weeks after Bundy's arrest. Following Bundy's arrest, Seattle authorities were convinced that Bundy's first victim was a 15-year-old girl named Kathy Devine, who went missing on November 25, 1973, and whose decomposed body was found a month later. Despite the fact that Bundy had confessed to this murder, he always considered himself innocent. Bundy was finally executed on January 24, 1989, after serving 10 years in prison. During his last interview, he admitted that he killed 40 women. One of Bundy's most famous quotes about his crimes found in Dr. James Dasbong's book, Life on the Edge, is, we are the serial killers of your children. We are your husbands. We are everywhere, and tomorrow there will be more children than you. They will be killed. Bundy's body was cremated after the execution at the request of his family, and his ashes were scattered in the mountains of Washington. <laughs>